you last week, Justin Jefferson talked about you uh, saying Coop is good, but I'll rank myself above him. Do you care to give your thoughts on that comment? No, I would hope he would, he would say that. You know, I, I think that's the that's the beauty of this game, and um, I think it speaks to the competitiveness of this of this league. You know, there's a I don't think if you're if you're not putting yourself as the best and you're not you're not working to be the best, then uh, I think uh, I'd be I'd be concerned about stepping on the field with you if you don't feel like you've prepared to be the best player that you can be. So you know I, I respect his opinion and uh, I can also respectfully disagree. Keep waiting for that beard to end up going full ZZ top for Cooper Cup. That's a disappointment. He didn't grow it out a little bit more in the off season. Justin Jefferson puts himself ahead of Cooper Cup. Matthew Berry disagrees. Cup number one, Jefferson number two. There's the top ten that Matthew has put together for this year's fantasy receivers. Matthew Berry still with us on set. What do you got? Before we move on, so we've seen Cooper Cup there. Fun story about fantasy. We were just talking about Bill Belichick, you know, saying he doesn't care about your fantasy team. But uh, we had uh, on my on my show last year, we had Cooper Cup's father. So Cooper Cup's father, who, by the way, former pro quarterback, backed up Troy Aikman for a number of years, plays in a fantasy league with a bunch of his buddies, a bunch of his college buddies. And every year, uh, they just let him have Cup. And they let him have his his son. And last year, because Cup was so amazing, they made a rule <laughs> he's not allowed to have his son anymore. Like, they, you know, like if you want your son, you have to draft him now. We're not going to let you just have your own kid. And I asked him, I said, like, did you explain to them, like, hey, it, it why don't you produce your own all-star <laughs> football players? It's not my fault. I have all-pro <laughs> DNA, and you guys don't. You know, but uh, no. But I just thought that was very funny. Like Cooper Cup's father is not allowed to draft Cooper Cup anymore. And he uh, really was incredible last year. Almost yeah. set the single-season record for yards and what was it? Uh, yards, receptions, receptions touchdowns, yeah, everything, points, everything. everything. I, a monster year. A monster year from start to finish. And what concerns me now, we talked about this earlier in the program as it relates to Matthew Stafford and the elbow, the tendonitis, if for some reason he misses time and it's John Wolford. I know it's system-driven, but still, there's a difference between Stafford and Wolford. That's going to affect Cup's overall production. Sure. And it's impossible impossible to factor that in. Yeah. Did you factor any of this uncertainty with Stafford? in any way into this or this is no, just cup not, cup in that system and what he did last year he's the guy yeah i mean that's exact that's exactly it and, and you have to deal with what you know right as far as we know as of this morning matthew stafford's going to play you know all 17 games if that changes right then then you adjust but it's hard to adjust a but there's no question stafford misses time that affects that affects cooper, cooper cup that affects Allen robinson Honestly, it would affect Cam Akers and Daryl Henderson because you expect them to lean on the run game a little bit more, right? You know, and so it just it sort of opens everything up, and you know, it's really interesting, uh, you know, thinking about the Rams as a as an offensive unit because you know they went from a team that you felt was sort of loaded, and now you're like, it's, it gets pretty dicey. Van Jefferson's banged up as well, and you, so you're sort of like, they've got Higby who they like a lot, obviously a tight end, but like it feels. After Cooper Cup and Allen Robinson, it feels pretty thin for a team that, you know, had a lot of depth. Obviously, Beckham's not back with the team yet, and uh, we'll see what ends up happening there and if he plays this year. And I don't know. So uh, the Rams are fascinating. Jefferson's got a good chance to pass him this year just because of the fact that he generated so much last year in an offense that wasn't as creative as it presumably will be this year with Kevin O'Connell, the former Rams assistant, now running the show. The Vikings have an offensive coach for the first time since Brad Childress. They're moving Jefferson all around the place like Cup. He's been saying that since Kevin O'Connell got the job. He was the happiest guy, I think, in Minnesota when O'Connell gets the job because he gets the chance to be the Cooper Cup in that offense, and he's got to throw everybody. You can't survive in this league if you don't have a tremendous amount of confidence. That's like Cup said. I'd like to think he would say that. You're not going to say, no, I'm number five. But – uh, I, I think he could be he could be really really good this year considering how good he was last year with the limitations the team had. He I mean he's a special player. I have it too. Yeah. But you know but it's hard to Justin Jefferson confidence aside. Uh, it is hard to put him above Cooper Cup. It's hard to put anyone above Cooper Cup. I mean Cooper Cup's season last year was historic. Well I mean like like literally like Randy Moss you know I mean like unbel- like the number of records Cooper Cup set last year, and so now you go to Justin Jefferson, but I think this is really interesting. So I did, I, I did a column for NBC Sports Edge 
uh, called 100 Facts, which is which is up now. And I have a bunch of facts about Kirk Cousins, and this obviously relates to Justin Jefferson. I mean, like, just look at those numbers. Justin Jefferson had a monster year, and he was still over 300 passing yards, you know, below. He, he still was, like, you know, almost 40 receptions behind him, six touchdowns behind him. And again, Jefferson, I mean, like, Cooper Cup probably could have stopped playing in, I want to say, like week 14 and still would have been the number one wide receiver in fantasy. That's just how stupid the numbers are for Cooper Cup. Having said that about Jefferson, though, let's talk about this Vikings offense for a, for a second. I think this is pretty interesting, okay? Here's the entire list, the entire list of quarterbacks that have thrown at least 30 touchdown passes each of the last two years. Okay, here's the list. Aaron Rodgers makes sense. Tom Brady, that makes sense. Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert. And Kirk Cousins. That's the list. Like, so you've got the five guys that are like at the top of the fantasy charts, the top of, you know, all pros, and then Kirk Cousins. And no one ever likes Kirk Cousins. You know what I mean? He's like, eh, he's meh. But Kirk Cousins, um, uh, again, is this is the those the guys that I just mentioned are the only people with more total touchdown passes over mm-hmm. the last two years than Cousins. Mike under Mike Zimmer last year, they were bottom 14 in pass rate. And to your point. Uh, and he's had, by the way, Cousins has had at least 4,000 passing yards six of the last seven seasons. Doesn't get hurt. Is there the upside of Kirk Cousins? Is Kirk Cousins going to magically put you on his back and win you a game the way that a Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady can? No. But he's better than I think he gets credit for. Agreed. I, I think he is a top 10, top 12-ish quarterback, both in real life and in fantasy. And to your point... Now he gets Kevin O'Connell and Wes Phillips over from the Rams, who just helped Matthew Stafford to the best year of his career. Stafford was a top five fantasy quarterback last year and a Super Bowl champion. And so I think people are sleeping a little bit on this Vikings offense and especially Kirk Cousins. Fantasy wise, like again, he's he's, you know, inside my top 13, right? He's nothing, he's there's a limited upside. But there's also a limited downside. And for your deeper league, your two quarterback league, I think Cousins is interesting. Jefferson should be number two. Speaking of those Vikings, by the way, I think Irv Smith is an interesting sleeper as well. He's healthy. And Adam Thielen's being left for dead. Like, Adam Thielen was very productive last year. Like, just because he's not as good as Justin Jefferson at this point of his career, Adam Thielen is still a really good NFL wide receiver. Still a really, really great route runner. And that is an offense that is going to throw a lot. They're going to throw a lot more than they have, and they may throw it more effectively, and they may have more plays designed where Cousins doesn't have the walls closed, and that's the biggest problem for him. When the walls close in, it's over. Yeah, He can't do anything with his legs like a Mahomes or an Allen can do. We need to take a quick break. When we return, though, I want to ask Matthew Barry about the challenges of trying to figure out where guys fit when receivers change one team to another, one quarterback to another, specifically with Tyreek Hill in Miami. We'll talk about that next on this Friday edition of PFT Live. This was six days ago. Back together Saturday, somebody rolling the video, and that is Tua Tonga Bailoa, the left-handed throw, 65 yards in the air, trying to overthrow Tyree Kill, but that's Tyree Kill. You cannot overthrow Tyree Kill. All right, Matthew Berry here still with us, and there is a dynamic this year, especially with so many. At least he hit him in stride. That's by the way. Uh, just that's a, he had to actually lay out for it a little bit. Yeah. Tyree Kill, when you when you make Tyree Kill do that, you've really put sure. a lot on it because that's Tyree Kill. So you got Tyree Kill changing. Teams. Devontae Adams changing teams. AJ Brown, we talked about him earlier. He changes teams. How let's and let's focus on Tyreek Hill, because you go from Patrick Mahomes. Sure. And Tyreek Hill has been phenomenal. Now you've got the questions. Is Tua going to be able to do that in a game? Are they going to have to work to get the ball in Tyreek's hands? How, how do you because you've got him at number eight? Some people would say it's a little low. How big of an impact is that, that you go from a known situation where you've got Mahomes to who knows what we're going to get? I mean, it's obviously, I think if he's back in um, in Kansas City, he's probably, you know, wide receiver two or three. So you discount a little bit. Phenomenal talent. They paid him a ton of money. He's obviously going to be a focal point of that offense. We are bullish on Mike McDaniel, right, based on what he's done he's in San awesome. Francisco. He's right. just awesome. Yeah. So we're really bullish on Mike McDaniel and what that offense is going to look like, and we believe – or I believe that he will manufacture touches for Tyreek Hill, and they will be creative about getting the ball in his hands, in space, in a variety of different ways. But to your point, right, you have to look at the entire situation because now he goes to a quarterback that's a downgrade. You know, I'm not trying to dump on Tua, but he ain't Patrick Mahomes, right? That is a downgrade. Even if Tua has Tyreek a Tyreek is the only one who thinks that it's not a downgrade. Right. That, yeah, he, he says, he still says that 
Tua is the most accurate quarterback in the NFL, and I think most people realize with a functioning brain that Tua's got some, some work to do to prove to anyone that he's accurate and reliable and can do what he did in a game, what we saw in that clip from last Saturday. And then you also think about who else the Dolphins have, right? So they've, they've added Jalen Waddell. Uh, they added Cedric Wilson. They have Gusecki. Um, they, have, they have guys that can be used in the passing game. This is why I think the Dolphins are a fascinating offense this year. They add Chase Edmonds. They add Raheem Mostert. Raheem Mostert's a better pass-catching running back than I think people realize. And, and so they have a lot of guys that are going to be able to touch the ball and do a bunch of things. So I'm fascinated to watch what this Dolphins offense is. But uh, I think there is a – so Tyreek Hill's still going to get his, but maybe does he get as big a target share um, as he had in Kansas City? Is Are there as many explosive plays as that in Kansas City? I mean, Patrick Mahomes can flick his wrist and it goes 80 yards. Right? And so – Two are just, I don't know that other, this side of Josh Allen that, that anyone has the arm strength of Patrick Mahomes, right? So we think there's a downgraded quarterback. It is a new system. There are more mouths to feed in that Dolphins offense, but he's still Tyreek Hill. He's still insanely fast. He's still faster than Yah, his old Twitter handle, right? And so he comes in at number eight for me. Uh, we expect a very good year, but not as good a year as he's had in Kansas City, at least from a fantasy perspective. It is interesting, though, that the Dolphins have said, like, Listen to her. If it doesn't work this year, it ain't on us. Yeah. Like, we're giving you as many. We're giving you an offensive-minded coach. We're adding all these pieces. You, you know, Jalen Waddle was awesome last year. Like, Improve like, the offensive line with Toronto Armstead. Yeah. yeah, it's no excuses 2022 for Tua Tonga-Vailoa without question. And Tyreek, one of the many things he said on It Needed to Be Said, his podcast, is that he recognizes that first-round pick, third-year quarterback, if you don't get it done, you're done. And, and I think whether he intends to or not, he is putting extra pressure on him by saying all these things. We'll see if Tua can live up to it. Right. Um, and what's weird is I, feel, I actually feel bad for Tua. Yes. Because he comes in the league, uh, you know, banged up hip. The, the franchise has obviously gone through a lot of turmoil and now continues to. Obviously, there's a lot of off-the-field stuff that, that if you're Tua in your court, they're going to ask him about it. And even if it's just like, I don't know, it was before I got here. Or like, I don't, you know, I was just trying to win games. And, you know, whatever. It, there's a lot of stuff that happens that, but he's, it's, it's his a distraction. His entire career, it starts off, we want Joe Burrow, I uh, will take Tua. Then it's, we want Deshaun Watson, we'll settle for Tua. Oh, we want Tom Brady, uh, we'll just stick with Tua. And after this year, it's going to be somebody else if, if Tua doesn't get it done. Let me ask about Devontae Adams because we're running out of time yeah. here. You mentioned target share, and I heard you say this either on the air or off air in the past couple of days, the idea that you go from Green Bay where you're the guy, and now you're in – Las Vegas with Darren Waller and Hunter Renfro. And even you, even though you still may be one of the best receivers in the NFL, you're not going to have the production because you're not getting the ball as much as he, you were. He had a north of 30% target share in Green Bay each of the last three years. North of 30%. I mean, just, it, you know, massive. And so going from Aaron Rodgers to Derek, uh, Derek Carr is a downgrade. There are more weapons, more mouths to feed. He goes to a coach in Josh McDaniels. The Patriot way is always about trying to share the, you know, share the love. And, and now... Devontae Adams still amazing, but given the lack of target share and going from Rodgers to Carr, he's the guy that usually is the number one wide receiver in fantasy. I am at number four. Look, it, it's sort of those two-way street, and this is a debate you always have in fantasy. There, are, he's he's going to get less balls because there's there's more competition, right? So he's got Waller and Renfro, players uh, that he didn't have next to him in Green Bay, but also he's got Waller and Renfro. In Green Bay, you're like, we're going to double and triple team Devontae Adams and, you know, we'll take our chances with Alan Lazard or, Van, uh, you know, Marcus Valdez-Scantling or whatever. And here they're going to be like, well, we'll kill you with Waller or Renfro or, or whatever. So you'll probably see um, less double coverage and triple coverage and less defenses rolling to him this year. But he's also going to get less, less, less uh, targets. Whatever. He's Devontae Adams. He's going to be just fine. Wide receiver four. If he's your number one wide receiver, you're going to be just fine this year. We're going to be just fine with Matthew Barry here as part of the NBC Sports family, the fantasy football goat. We need to take a break. We'll have more PFT Live for you right after this. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.